I, I need a little time to prepare here, so not me. I can go anytime you like. We start with um, this one. So the first radiograph that I saw was this radiograph. And it's kind of the patients in the ICU and you look at this and you say, well, intubated, okay, the patient's really sick. I think it's a really nice example of interstitial and alveolar edema. Um, interstitial in the sense that we have really nice example of septal lines. Some of these here are quite long. Maybe there are a couple close together that make the long line. But septal lines are present, subpleural edema, interstitial related to the interlobar fissure. If there wasn't perhaps a bit of motion, this may be a peribronchial fluid cuff there perhaps. And then of course, a lot of lung consolidation. So the appearance is that of lung edema. The question is, what is the context? and what it's due to, and that's where things get interesting. So that is around, well, that's about the same time. So we have the same findings there. And then we have one that I'll show you a bit later in the afternoon, which is that one, and it looks just as bad. Now there's a pulmonary artery catheter in, it still looks like lung edema. And then I'll just show you one from the next day showing less lung edema, but pleural fluid accumulation. So those two things go together. So then I began to dig into the case and I found out the following, that the patient developed this right in the operating room after a neurosurgical procedure was done. And I'll show you that information in a moment in which they operated on the patient um, in the sitting position. During the operation, they, do, they were monitoring the patient with a TEE and what was described by the person reading that was that there were bubbles, air bubbles like you see here. And as best I can tell, this is the um, pulmonary artery, I think the aorta is somewhere here. And what they described was air in the uh, pulmonary artery and these bubbles persisted. So there was clearly an outflow issue related to these air bubbles. And yes, this is air embolism, pretty substantive, with air, kind of an air lock phenomenon in relation to the uh, pulmonary artery and lung edema as a consequence of that. So let's see if I have the uh, op report there. So this is the kind of the description there that you see there. And you can see a description of the, oh, they put in saline, excuse me, agitated saline persistent well after injection, indicating considerable impedance to the fluid flow from the right heart. I mean, patient at venous hair embolism intra-op resulting in the lung edema, as you can see there. So I think this is the first case of that that I've personally seen. I've certainly heard about that before. And here's a nice review article that I'll send along, sorry, below, about this phenomenon. It's actually quite a long article. It's a really nice article. They, they describe the diagnosis and treatment of vascular air embolism, the context in which that happens, the clinical presentation. And for example, here you can see that it occurs in different contexts, but classic in neurosurgery when the vein is potentially open, as you can see right, right there. Have any of you guys seen this phenomenon before? I think it's my first case of lorid lung edema from venous air embolism. I have not, no, that's impressive. Oh. I've seen um, ER cases that died, but this is the first person that survived, so that's really dramatic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do want to show you one other thing, and here I speculate, yeah, this is pretty dramatic. So this is a follow-up CT that he had. So this is now, let me just get the timing right. So this is the fifth. He was pretty ill for a long period of time. So the CT, and I'm not quite sure why this was done, but this is on the 18th. And I will show you this. So my speculation is that these opacities that you see in the area lungs, 
that are subplural may actually represent small infractions of lung. If a sufficient amount of air went into the pulmonary arteries, occluded vessels, and actually produced sufficient ischemia. But it's really interesting that he has these focal, multifocal, anterior subpleural opacities in the lungs. And non-enhancing. Not yeah, enhanced. Right. And I think it's very plausible. That is the result of the ischemia from the embolized air. Yep. That's what I'm thinking. Obviously, he has pleural fluid and he's got some lung atelectasis, but I think that's a likely explanation for those opacities there. So that was pretty dramatic. Pretty dramatic case. Wow. Uh, this one, I know David in particular will like, so I'll show you this one. This is actually a nice radiograph to uh, teach with in the sense that, in my experience, when people look at this, they'll describe some areas of atelectasis in the lower lung zones and maybe not appreciate how much atelectasis there actually is, particularly here in the right lower and middle lobe. So I might use this separately as a it's kind of a teaching case for atelectasis. Um, there's substantial atelectasis of the right lower and middle lobes. I'll show you a CT that goes along with that. So there's a time interval here. This is the second, and then this will be the 17th. And you'll see here how much atelectasis is indeed present in the lower lung zones, particularly right middle and lower, of course. And also a nice teaching example of what fluid or food or at least material looks like in the bronchial tree. So these bronchi contain stuff. It may be aspirated fluid, for example, or secretions or combinations thereof in the right lower and middle lobes. So the other observation to make here is look at muscle. So we see shoulder girdle muscle around the shoulder girdles, but look at pectoralis, look at serratus, uh, look at uh, lower down latissimus dorsi, intercostal muscles. They're very atrophied. And now let me bring up the coronal <clears throat> to show you the diaphragmatic pleura in particular. So if we look down here, um, these crura are relatively small, very thin. Let me bring up the axials to show you that as well. So here on the axial, if we go down and we look at the thickness of the crura, they are, in my view, thin structures. And this is a relatively young person. So there's a lot of muscle atrophy involving the skeletal muscle as well as the diaphragm as well and the atelectasis. And this is an um, unfortunate individual with muscular dystrophy. So he's got muscular dystrophy type 1. And I think it fits very nicely that he's unfortunately got a lot of muscle weakness, including the diaphragm. And um, as you can see from this particular summary, that with muscular dystrophy type 1, and there's another one type 2, I can't remember the differences, but certainly diaphragm weakness can be a very substantial problem. So I'm not sure if I've seen that before or maybe haven't recognized it before, but I think it's a very nice uh, depiction of those findings. Very cool. Yeah, it's a real dilemma because he's a young person. Howard, on the sagittal view, yes. can we look at the anterior diaphragm muscle on yes. sagittal? Yes, and it's, I'm glad you reminded me because the one that we can see is on the left side and it's thin. So there is spleen and it, it is thin. I don't know if it's actually fatty replaced, but it's too thin here, right? Right. And yeah. both, both sides are thin, right? Yeah, I think it's really hard to see when the liver's there to actually tease apart the uh, liver and the atelectasis from that diaphragm. Got it. And I think for sure on the sagittal, that's another good place to look for, especially on the left side, as we see here. Mm -hmm. It's too thin, yeah. Very so, cool. not a 
not good for the sprue guy, but um, a nice, a nice complex of findings that fits together. Yes, Jeff. Did he have any uh, thinning of his myocardium at all, or was it just the skeletal muscle? Ah, let's have a look. I think it's just skeletal. They can definitely have cardiomyopathy, right? Let's have a look at the thickness of of heart muscle. Looks pretty thick there. Yeah, the left side looks all right, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I presume, you know, they, they obviously they can aspirate. So I don't know if this is aspiration and or secretions and inability to clear secretions or combinations thereof. But there's a bunch of stuff in these bronchi which certainly doesn't help this poor person. All right, let me show you this one. This one's really an interesting one. So um, this is sort of apropos of the case that um, Travis <clears throat> sent out earlier this week. So this is a comparison radiograph from 2014. So this is March of 2014 in this person. The radiograph that I saw the other day is this one. So this is from just the other day. And the history did say chest pain. So I looked at this and I noticed this. So here's this right convex mediastinal lung interface, which is different from before. And that really caught my attention in the history of uh, chest pain. So then to make a long story short, and there's one item of information which I'm withholding for the moment because I didn't perceive that initially. But I will show you that I did call and suggested that he may have an acute aortic problem, acute aortic syndrome. And for reasons I'll mention in a moment, uh, the further evaluation was a little bit delayed. But here is the appearance of this aorta in this person. So that accounts for that imaging finding. So we have this large, wide necked ulcer like projection in the aorta and here's the opacified portion of it here is down here the non-opacified portion and of course this corresponds exactly with that so it turns out that in 20, 2015 he had a lung perfusion scan but it was formed it was performed as a uh, spect ct lung perfusion scan so you know this is that the spec portion over here as part of the perfusion scan. But what's really interesting, and this was called previously, so a person made a really good observation on the CT portion of the spec CT exam previously, of findings of an intramural hematoma, acute hyperattenuating, even on this low dose CT in the aorta, exactly where we see the finding now. So you can see the extent of it. It goes up there in the aortic arch, ascending aorta, and right in here. So I think this is, and that wasn't treated because of his advanced age. It was elected not to, to treat or perform further evaluation of it at the time. So here's, I think, the evolution of what we know can happen, and that's the formation of the so-called large ulcer-like projection as a, a consequence of acute IMH of the aorta. See there. Have you guys seen that before at one this large? I think that's the most likely explanation by far, putting it all together. No, I showed I the think, traumatic injury a week or so ago, but um I would wonder about trauma in this case too, because um you know he's got he's got interval rib fractures between the two chest x-rays that you showed, how are the yes, uh, he does. The, has a lot of healed rib fractures. He does, yeah. The location for a penetrating ulcer, those are usually in the atherosclerotic, the descending part of the aorta and the abdominal aorta, rather now, than- I'm not calling this a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Okay. Uh, this is a complication of an IMH and the formation of what's called an ulcer-like projection. When they are very small, and typically in the descending aorta, they sometimes call intramural blood pool when they're small. But when they're larger, they're called ULPs. So what, do you think, what do you think caused the intramural hematoma? What, initially, 
I think this is just a spontaneous uh, intramural hematoma in an older person at this at this time back then. When did, when did the rib trauma occur? It occurred sometime in between. It's true. Howard, that's, uh, that's a really good example. I mean, we were just talking here about how we've seen multiple of these, and almost all of these, uh, you know, appearances have, we could trace back to an intramural hematoma, you know, where there was an etymal rent, and then um, you develop this uh, ulcer-like projection. And uh, it's th this is the appearance that, that we've had on on all of ours, or you know, the ones that are this big have been have looked like this in the setting of intramural hematoma. So, <clears throat> Brenda, are they also in the ascending aorta like this? Yes, we have uh, several examples. I can bring one next time, but it's um, yeah. I mean, it, and honestly, if you look back at um, some of these with the acute intramural type A hematomas. Um, you can sometimes find, or even prospectively, you can find like a little, uh, I know Howard has shown some of these before where you find a little little intimal uh, rent, uh, intimal tear that you can just barely see. And then that, that just goes on, you know, over time to develop this um, ulcer-like projection from a larger intimal, um, you know, rent. And uh, this, is, this is the appearance that we've seen in multiple of ours, uh, intramural hematomas. Yep, yep. I've never seen anything like this before in the ascending aorta. So, Jeff, have you? I think the ones that I've seen. Other than that traumatic injury that I showed, but that was pseudo aneurysm. The ones that I remember seeing in articles about this entity have been primarily in the descending aorta, it's true. But I'm sure one can find examples of one in the ascending aorta too, I'm sure of that. And Howard, I think the uh, the key, like you were saying, is that there's no atherosclerotic disease here. You know, this and you know, if you look around that, there's no atherosclerotic disease in the in that portion of the aorta. So it's not a you know, like you're saying, it's not a um, penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer, which you do see more commonly in the descending and abdominal aorta. So it's a different um, pathologic entity, it seems. Yep. 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 Exactly. So let me show you another one because it fits exactly with this as well. So here's another really nice teaching case as well. So this is another person, ED, bedside chest radiography, chest pain. And the nice teaching aspect of this one is if you're lucky enough to make that observation where your eyes are attracted to the aorta or you're looking at it and you see that there is too much distance between intimal atheromatous calcification and the outer wall of the aorta. So this distance is too great. Now sometimes on frontal radiography, just because of beam angulation, you can have a false positive call of that. That is, you think this distance is too great, but it actually isn't. But in this person, as you'll see, this is a real finding. And that distance between these two things is, is quite a bit. So that's a really nice observation. So if you have chest pain, and you make that observation, then you really are thinking of an acute aortic syndrome with displacement of intimal atheromatous calcification. So I will show you the corresponding image here, coronal, and you'll see that we, this is from the outside, let me just snag that up, that we have a correspondence with the radiograph and what we see here. So you can see there's atheroma but there are findings here of, again, intramural pathology. I don't have a non-contrast here, just this contrast exam. Let me bring up the axial, and you'll see that. So we have, sorry, oh, I take that back. Subsequently, a non-contrast CT was done. So this was done afterwards. So undoubtedly, if this had been obtained at the same time as the one that I showed you, then you would see this hyperattenuating classic intramural hematoma of the aorta in the same location. So that was subsequently, let me go back to the previous one and show you the typical findings of intramural hematoma in relation to the aortic arch and descending aorta. And then just apropos of our discussion a moment ago, here is a place or an example of where you can see that there is a little bit of communication between the wall of the aorta just here and the lumen somewhere right there. 
So there has to be a little more breach of the intima to allow some of the contrast medium to exit the lumen to go into the wall. And this is the kind of thing that people are showing more of where you can demonstrate an intermedial breach like this. And this person just in that location is the only place that I saw it. How far down does the IMH go? Does it go all the way to the diaphragm? Yeah, it goes a fair amount, doesn't it? You know, further down, it, it's a little hard to tell because there's undoubtedly some intraluminal thrombus in this aorta as well. Let's have a look and see on this post, on this pre-intervention exam, how far it goes down. You can put the displaced calcium there and so on. It goes, it goes down quite a ways, you know, somewhere down here. These two, you know, here, and then calcium seems to be displaced. So a really nice example of that. He did subsequently have a stent placed in his, oh, here it is, in the aorta for that. Okay, so I showed you those. Okay, this is a quickie. So the history, which I didn't have initially here, but which I did get from the medical record, goes along very nicely. So this is a person with a chest radiograph that looks like that. And if you're lucky enough to have the history, which I'll show you in a moment, you can look in the right place and perceive that there is something odd about this rib. So it's, it's anomalous compared to the other side. It looks like a cervical rib or something like a cervical rib, or at least an anomalous first rib, but it's short, it goes um, in that location in a funny spot, but certainly there is a rib abnormality there. Let's see if I have the history. So let me just give you the history there. So look at that history. This is a 34 year old person. And you can see he's got symptoms related to his left arm as indicated there. And certainly with that imaging finding, we're on the trail of thoracic outlet syndrome and so on. And here is a nice example of an MRA that was done that shows, let me see, get a nice image, <clears throat> that indeed he has thrombus right there in the subclavian artery. So rib anomaly and thoracic arterial outlet syndrome in the sense that he has focal arterial subclavian artery thrombosis and they subsequently operated on him. Let's see what they found. Here you can see a description of the surgery and what they did right there. Whoops, sorry about that. How did that Right there. So they also did some neurolysis, anterior scalenectomy, section of the rib. And then they did the carotid subclavian bypass as well for that. There's the angio. <clears throat> All right, Jeff, those are my cases. Those are great, Howard, thank you. Sure. All right, thanks. David, are you ready? Uh, I think so. All righty. <clears throat> so um, I'm part of this national screening program that takes the, um, the workers who built the nuclear power uh, or the, nu the nuclear sites for the Department of Energy when the atomic bomb program was being built. So the biggest of these sites, like the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington, is the most polluted site, I think, in the whole country because of all of the radiation that was released and you know, things trickling into the soil over the years since they were producing plutonium for the um, atomic and hydrogen bombs. 
So, um, <clears throat> so the workers at these sites are get this surveillance program, and their usual exposure is asbestos. So this fellow had this abnormal set of radiographs here showing upper lung disease here that if I had to tie this to pneumoconiosis would fit better for silicosis than it would for uh, asbestos exposure. And he has um, he had a CT scan, which also shows small nodules and then these bigger collections here. And looks like a case of progressive massive fibrosis here with these big, fairly symmetrical upper lung uh, conglomerate masses. And let me just scroll through this. So it's really predominantly upper lung disease. There's a peripheral component. There's a, some stuff along fissures, so it fits nicely with that. So I asked the, the people who sent these studies if they had any more occupational uh, exposure history. And this man had done other work besides <clears throat> on these nuclear reservations and had been uh, involved in mining and rock, rock crushing operations. So he was exposed to a lot of rock dust. So here's a case of sort of unexpected silicosis in a population that usually uh, shows us um, asbestos findings, if any. And there are associated calcified mediastinal hyalur lymph nodes here, which also go with this kind of pneumoconiosis. So unexpected, uh, unexpected silicosis-like findings here in somebody who um, would typically, in the, in the work for the nuclear industry, would have been exposed more to asbestos. Uh, David, do they do you ever yeah. see beryllium disease related to nuclear yeah, we, weapons? And we do. We do see that, right? And the cases I've seen uh, in, in the Hanford cleanup, for instance, are usually lymphadenopathy that looks like sarcoid lymphadenopathy, nice symmetrical hyalur and mm -hmm. sometimes mediastinal lymphadenopathy, but rarely do we see lung disease. And uh, this fellow, I don't think had had exposure to beryllium. So um, his he was exposed to rock dust, but not, not beryllium, as far as I know. Okay. But that is also in the differential, and even inhaled talc could give <laughs> similar findings to this. So sarcoidosis, beryllosis, talc inhalation, uh, and sarcoid are all things that we have to consider together as possibilities. <clears throat> then I'd like to show you this um, this person who um, is a woman in her 30s who uh, complains of coughing up these big um, mucus plugs. <clears throat> and uh, it was, it's been compared to her, her experience coughing these things up is like a scene in the Harry Potter series, which I don't recall, where uh, Harry Potter's best friend is bewitched somehow and he's coughing up these slugs. So slimy slugs are coming out of her lungs and she gets desperately short of breath. And this is one of her um, let me show you an earlier radiograph on her. This is the way she looked um, early in her course. So she had stuff that looked like aspiration scattered around, mostly in the right lung base, but some stuff on the other side too. So she had what looked like recurrent aspiration, probably caused by these mucus plugs causing some atelectasis and retained secretions and things like that. So at an outside hospital, she had um, she had a CT scan that showed <clears throat> and this is similar findings here. It shows a lot of stuff in the mediastinum, a lot of abnormal tissue here. And so we see this stuff throughout the mediastinum and um, we see all this crud in the lung bases here. This is the, with the stuff that looks like aspirated lung stuff. <clears throat> and then she even has <clears throat> some of these similar abnormalities in the upper abdomen here that also look like lymphadenopathy in the paraspinal location. So abnormal tissue here in the abdomen and chest, I thought this was going to be lymphoma. <clears throat> okay, that was my concern. She got a biopsy and she did not have lymphoma. So <clears throat> this condition uh, is called plastic bronchitis when people cough up these abundant and frequent um, gelatinous mucus plugs. And this can lead to, I mean, people can aspirate a lot of stuff on these things and they can be asphyxiated by these rapidly forming mucus plugs. It implies that there's something wrong with lymphatics and lymphatic drainage backing up into the chest is the typical cause. So this woman had a lymphangiogram. Let me show you uh, her lymphangiogram here. So you can see that from this injection in the groin, <clears throat> groin lymph node, she has refluxed 
a lot of stuff here into the right lung lymphatic. So there is retrograde flow <clears throat> of the injected uh, ethiodol into the lung here. So let me show you some other images of this. And they identify dilation of the of these thoracic large lymphatic ducts and then narrowing where they insert into the uh, venous angle on the left. So it was it was narrowed there. Their intent was to <clears throat> embolize the lymphatics to prevent the um, lymphatic drainage from getting to her lung and causing these big gelatinous mucus plugs to form. But here, this is early in the in the course of the lymphangiogram. And you can see there's already stuff at this early phase going out into the lung. They were unable to get into the thoracic duct to, uh, to embolize it, but the ethiodol itself will cause some sclerosis of the, of the lymphatics and might actually, in a lot of people, end up uh, curing their problem. So immediately after the lymphangiogram, <clears throat> it's when she had, um, let me show you a chest radiograph that followed here. This is after the lymphangiogram, at this point, a day after she had developed a big pleural effusion, which was new for her. Here's some of the contrast in thoracic lymphatics and in nodes and stuff like that around the neck. So she initially had a pleural effusion there that was new and that dried up. And this is a radiograph near discharge where she has pretty much cleared up the pleural effusion. She still has some uh, lung disease in the base here, but not as bad as before. So she got somewhat better. <clears throat> So I was very concerned about um, about lymphoma as the cause of the abnormal lymph drainage in her, the obstruction to her lymphatics. That turned out not to be the case based on mediastinoscopy and, and node biopsy. I was also concerned, could this be lymphangiomatosis? Could this be a proliferation of lymphatics that resulted in some obstruction and all of that tissue infiltrating her mediastinum? It was not uh, considered to be that either on, on biopsy. So we don't really know what the cause of her plastic bronchitis is. Here she's somewhat better and she's being followed. Her remote history, uh, there's not much. She has had problems with alcohol and she has some liver dysfunction, but um, you know nothing that you can really tie to this condition. So this is my first case in the flesh of plastic bronchitis. It's usually secondary to something that's causing lymphatic blockage. So tumor is a big, a big consideration, particularly lymphoma, but there are idiopathic plastic bronchitis syndromes like this. If she continues to have problems, it's thought that they will reattempt to do the lymphatic uh, embolization. They'll try to get into the thoracic duct and put some coils in and obstruct the lymph flow to her to her chest that's getting into her lungs and causing this uh, life-threatening uh, accumulations of mucus plugs, or sorry, of bronchial plugs. So, <clears throat> yeah. how's the group here for plastic bronchitis? Have you guys seen cases of this before? This yeah. is my first. We just had a couple of cases. We just had a case of a child with it that um, one of our in interventional radiologists uh, embolized um, the thoracic duct. Mm -hmm. It's all dilated, like in your case. Yeah. And it was it just considered idiopathic in that kid? There wasn't anything that you could tie it to? Right. And how are you, you've seen it too? Yeah, I've seen cases that um, are both related to lymphatic abnormalities, but also idiopathic. Um, mm -hmm. Usually they say if you can, you can take the aspirated material and put it under a microscope and try to identify what the stuff is. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you just get inflammatory cells, sometimes it's just a bit of fibrin, um, so, and then mucin. So I've seen a few cases of both uh, lymph and non-lymph plastic mm -hmm. bronchitis. In the cases of, as best I remember, of the non-lymph plastic bronchitis have been just idiopathic mm -hmm. in adults. A couple of cases that were just idiopathic, never made a diagnosis beyond plastic bronchitis due to accumulation of stuff. We, we have a couple, and uh, it's a known uh, Fontan, you know, chronic Fontan uh, complication. Association, that's from pediatric, that's right. Yeah, particularly. Yeah, good point. Those are my two cases. Great. All right. Brent, do you have some cases? 
Oh, yes. All right, here we go. Let's see. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, so just I have one kind of complex case and then a couple of shorter cases, very short cases. So um, this one is a patient who came in and had, um, you, know, you can see widening here of the mediastinum. You can see an endograft has been placed. Um, and there are a bunch of these funny coils um, projecting over the uh, endograft. And then um, you can see there's a uh, catheter here that courses down from the right edge. And then it makes a strange turn right there. And I'll show you what, what that is in in a second. Um, let me show you this CT. And I have a couple CTs here. The one, one of these is on transfer to um, our main hospital. And I want to show it to you because it shows the course of the catheter. Um, and then I'll talk about the aortic pathology here. So catheter is coming down here um, in the right IJ, and then um, it comes into um, you know the right uh, anomaly. And then you can see that it's coursing out into the lung. And so this is an anomalous uh, pulmonary venous return um, coursing there into um, kind of the right anomaly coming back back up. So that's where that, that catheter uh, was. Um, this patient also has some other, and I'll show you in a second better view of this, but here's another um, right here immediately. Here's another pulmonary vein that's coming into a duplicated uh, left SVC right in there. Um, you can see it's it's a pulmonary vein coming out and coming in. So there, there's bilateral upper lobe um, partial anomalous pulmonary return, and we have a catheter there. Let me show you um, the, you know, this is a dissection. This is a type B dissection, and you can see the endostent has been placed already. Coming down, you can see that there's some um, extending from the false lumen. Uh, there's this um, area of contrast uh, extravasation, and it seems to be going right into the, into the mediastinum. Um, and there's some high attenuation material here. I want to show you a more dramatic uh, right before um, transfer this at an outside hospital this patient um, has this this non contrast CT showing this um, contra abnormality along the anterior descending aorta um, high attenuation looks like blood um, there's blood in the mediastinum there's a right hemothorax um, this other um, pleural collection measures uh, blood as well so this dramatic um, presentation here of a ruptured um, type B aortic dissection. And let me show you here on the contrast study that um, extending from the false lumen there, there's that um, you know, area of contrast extravasation right into the mediastinum uh, from the false lumen and a lot of blood in the mediastinum going all the way up. So uh, you can see the anomalous pulmonary vein coming in there to the, um, the left SPC. Uh, you can also see the anomalous pulmonary vein on the other side and the right upper lobe come in where the catheter went there before. So just, you know, kind of a, a presentation of a ruptured um, type B dissection there with hemo, mediastinum, and hemothoraces and um, other findings. So I thought that was interesting. Hmm. Um, here's, yeah, here are some quick cases here. So um, here's a case of a patient who um, was getting set up for a transcatheter um, right, aortic valve. Toggle. Sorry. Green. Forgot. I know. It's there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, so this is a patient who was actually getting set up coming in because there uh, was some um, concern for aortic stenosis and being set up for a TAVI. You can see here, though, that the um, you know, aortic valve doesn't look too bad. But as you scroll down, you realize this patient had a bioprosthetic mitral valve replacement. And you can sort of get to get the flavor, start to get the flavor for what's going on, what's causing the kind of gradient uh, here. You can see that um, the um, anterior leaflet uh, right here, and the, in fact, the, um, the valve itself right there, you can see the, uh, the struts are obstructing the um, LVOT here. Um, let me show you. Uh, Dramatic. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. Three chamber view. Let me see if I can put that. Can you see that? Okay. 
Okay, so you can see the three chamber view here shows that the um, anterior, um, uh, you know, aspect leaflet of this uh, this uh, prosthetic mitral valve is actually obstructing dynamically obstructing the LVOT. You can see that there's very little um, uh, opening here on systole, and you can actually see the uh, chordae uh, tendae start to um, be sucked up through through the venturi effect uh, anteriorly. So there's some SAM here, some portal SAM of the chordae, um, and there is severe obstruction of the LVOT. So this is an interesting case in which the um, surgically placed valve has actually obstructed the LVOT and causes this functional obstruction um, of the uh, proximal uh, aortic LVOT. So um, it's going to be uh, Brent, what part of the valve is causing the obstruction? Did you say uh, strut or or leaflet? That well, like it's the strut. It's the strut, and then you can see the um, part of uh, the chordae here is also getting sucked up against it, and um, you can see that the, it's dynamically narrowing. Um, you know, primarily the strut, but also you can see the the chordae is getting pulled toward that. So there's some systolic anterior motion of that, and then on systole, uh, the strut is actually obstructing, as you said, the um, LVOT. So um, we, we found that, you know, or not, we haven't found, but um, a problem with mitral, with tabby placement now, is um, it, you can get some obstruction of the anterior leaflet of the, um, of the mitral valve, and some patients are predisposed to having that obstruction to the point where um, now, um, you know, special uh, procedure, a lampoon uh, procedure, uh, as it's called, can be used um, experimentally to um, kind of fulgurate that um, anterior leaflet so that um, you don't theoretically get as much obstruction. So, but this is the first thing I've seen of, um, um, Art Stillman showed me this case of where uh, the surgically placed valve is actually severely obstructing on uh, dynamically uh, the LVOT. So, so that was really interesting. So, and then just uh, maybe one other quick case here. One to, um, sorry, let me get back to my list here. Um, here's, uh, let me get back to the screen here. Okay, so this is one kind of a similar but different theme. Um, this is a patient who um, had a robotically placed um, mitral annuloplasty, and you can see coming down, you can see the annuloplasty ring right here. Um, and um, uh, more importantly, th this patient was having some persistent, um, you can look, see in the lungs here, um, we have edema, um, a lot of edema. We have a pleural effusion, septal thickening, brown glass throughout the lungs. And this, it turns out, was worse than on a prior study before the uh, annual, annular ring had been placed. And you can see here, this is the reason for that, though. Um, you can see that here's the posterior aspect of the mitral ring, and it's actually dehissed from the um, posterior aspect of the uh, mitral annulus here. So they saw on echo um, moderate to severe uh, insufficiency of the mitral valve. So um, this is a dehiscent uh, mitral ring, and they're going to have to go back in and do um, repair of, of this. So uh, just in so another. Perivalvular regurgitation. Right, perivalvular regurgitation uh, caused by dehiscence. And um, I, I'm looking, you know, very closely now at all these because I, I, I have a feeling that, um, you know, even on, well, this is a non-gated CT, for example, but I have a feeling that you, you know, um, we may be able to pick up, I, I know I've shown a couple of these before in this conference, but, um, you know, uh, we're looking more and more carefully for these, even at just CTs done for other reasons because, um, seems that uh, this is uh, not an uncommon thing to, to see. So, um, and then maybe just one more case here. Um, let's see. Here's a. Uh, sorry. Just wondered if other people have seen this um, before. This is a quick case. So, um, just a uh, patient. You know, you can see the soft tissues here. Um, no. Um, no just, you just oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I know it's annoying. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this, is, this is a patient with really no um, history of any systemic disease, but you can see that there is a well-defined fatty lesion here along the RV apex, um, along the septum. And the uh, first thing I look for when I see things like this is I look for um, tuberous sclerosis. <laughs> um, and uh, you don't see any, there's no history in the chart, um, you know, there are no skin lesions here. And um, so this presumably is just an isolated um, um, lipoma 
of the RV and just don't have very many. I think maybe I've seen one other isolated white palma like this, but by far the, the most common thing I see the myocardial fatty fossae in is just tuberous sclerosis. Um, so I just wonder if other people have seen uh, a lot of these or, you know, are we just, not, you know, uh, just seems very uncommon to have an isolated, presumably like palma of the right ventricle or the left ventricle for that matter. No, that's unusual. No, I haven't seen that. No cyst in the lungs, no? No, no. Um, and that was the second thing I looked for. And, um, you know, it almost always turns out that the patients have tuberous sclerosis, and, but this patient does not. So, but that's very, very interesting. But anyway, th those are my cases for this week. Great. Thank you. All right. I've got a few to show here. Let's see. Okay. Um, this is just nothing exciting, but let me see here. It's just beautiful. Um, let's see. All right. So this is a, how old is the guy? He's, um, middle-aged smoker was seen to pulmonologist for an abnormal CT, but I thought this was just a beautiful case of which is presumed to be respiratory bronchiolitis. You see it drops out as we go to the bases, but you know, interesting for me, I was quite taken by how di how well defined these central lobular nodules are. I mean, they're ground glass attenuation, but they're almost, they've sort of blossomed a little bit. So um, I don't know what his pulmonary function tests are, if this, you know, would, if the clinical diagnosis would fit RBILD, but I, I, I think the, the diagnosis is in doubt, but I thought this was just really pretty and it's just a good basic teaching case of central lobular nodules, you know, no exposures, active smoker, so HP would be really unlikely. Wow. Yeah, those are, you, usually each, one, each one is almost an asinus in size. So yeah. You could have like three to four per lobule. You could, right. almost, you could almost draw around some of these and say that's an asinus. Yeah, About I think the you're right. One. Yeah. Yeah, some of these. But it's just, it's, it's just, it's really nice. And, you know, I, 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 it's a spectrum clearly. And, you know, but usually when I see RB, it's really smudgy and subtle and a lot of patients, but I saved it because it was a pretty good one. Uh, this one's not so subtle. Uh, this is a young man. He is in his, um, I believe he's in his early forties. I wrote it down somewhere, but he presented with chest pain and he's got this mediastinal mass. I'm not showing you, Jeff. Oh, sorry. Let's try this again. I, I have not figured out how to override this and go to meetings. So you want to see this. All right. There we go. You should, PA radiograph. Okay. So he's got this anterior mediastinal mass. Here's the lateral. You know, 40 is kind of a tough age because he's kind of, um, you know, he's in the thymoma range, but and he's a little old for your typical diffuse large B cell lymphoma. He's kind of on the older side for germ cell tumor. Um, you know, anything's possible. Um, and he has a really nice CT, and um, this is, uh, they did delays for some reason, but uh, on the arterial phase, you will see that this mass is, it's got these hypervascular foci. But what's, I think, cool about it is what it's doing to the, to the main pulmonary artery in the RVOT. There's, I mean, it's, it's pretty slit-like here. If I make a, let's see, a coronal, I think you can really appreciate just how tight that um, pulmonary outflow track is, if I can find it. Um, Yes, yeah, it's, it's just a sliver of of contrast coming through right right there. Mm. And so he was having pretty progressive symptoms. And so before they even biopsied him, they got the labs and his, the alpha feta protein is through the roof. So this is a germ cell tumor of some sort and will be coming out shortly. But I believe it may have already come out. They did do some delays, um, which just shows this thing filling in. So when you give when you see the contrast features, it doesn't look like a um, lymphoma at all. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, you know, I don't think of thymomas as being particularly hypervascular either, but it's interesting what, what's going to, what kind of <clears throat> tissue they're going to find in here. The other thing is thymoma is usually soft and doesn't, doesn't, uh, narrow vascular structures as much. So well, I think I mean, they're, they're not as soft as, I don't know. I've seen a couple big thymomas, but they're usually on one side of the mediastinum and sort of push stuff out of the way, but don't squeeze it. Yeah, you're correct this tightly, but I think this thing is just growing really fast. And that may be why it's compressing it. Um, 
Speaking of mediastinal masses, um, this is uh, here. I'm going to make it display the right screen. This is kind of cool because you know so we we see we see aneurysms all the time, and you know they just do what they do. But this one's cool because he's got a subclavian artery aneurysm, and then on top of that has a he's had an aortic a ascending aortic repair, but has this sort of um, you know mildly dilated or mildly aneurysmal sort of proximal descending, and you can see what's happening. To the trachea. Let me make it a little bit bigger. But there's sort of like nut cracking the trachea in here, and so you kind of get this narrowing between the um, the dilated aorta, but the subclavian artery aneurysm is not allowing the trachea to move out of the way. It's not obviously as severe as that the last case I showed you, but you see here there's a looks like either an old dissection or um, layering thrombus in that um, descending aorta, but sort of a tracheal stenosis, almost like a ring here. But more of a nutcracker. Unfortunately, I don't have a radiograph. That would be kind of a nice one. Um, this is a fun case. I think you guys will all like this one, and hopefully, I will be able to display everything appropriately. So we've seen a lot of scimitars um, in this on this webinar, um, and here is one such scimitar. But this one is neat because this one has been repaired, and then there's a complication of the repair. So um, first of all. Um, Following what's been called Caney's rule, you'll see there's a left SVC um, to go along with our scimitar. There's a thread-like brachycephalic vein. So we have duplicated superior vena cava. Patient does have some pulmonary arterial enlargement. And you'll see there, this is what was the scimitar vein coming down part in the train. Um, we missed the tornado drill earlier. Um, so anyway, this was the scimitar vein. And what they did to repair it because this was a sizable shunt, the entire right lung was draining to the IVC, and it went in right here. Uh, they created a baffle that goes into the left atrium, and you see what this little sort of fold is. And I'll put it up on a, on a coronal. Um, but what was happening was the, the, the baffle had become steno stenotic, probably it's sort of a kink. Um, and then there was a little bit of leakage, and I don't know how well it's going to show up. Um, there was a little bit of leakage through the where they tried to oversew or, or close the, the scimitar vein where it empties into the SV right here. You see there's a little jet of contrast kind of right in there. So it was leaking. Um, so we have an MR. Uh, let's see. That's the localizer. And unfortunately, it's sort of how Osiris likes to mix jumble up series when you combine them. But let's see if I can find the coronal MRA. We'll show a little bit of the anatomy. And then I can have the angiogram that shows... The repair, and they—I think it was a pretty clever repair. They did it all endovascular. Oh, man, let's see. Too many sequences on these studies. Um, well, here's a delay. So it's a sagittal acquisition, but I'll—I'll I'll make it coronal. But you can see um, we've got the there's the little bit of reflux into the hepatic veins through the little leak there. Here's the baffle coming in to the to the atrium. And you see right here is the communication. So it's got this kink right in here. And then the, the baffle is supposed to plug in the left atrium, and it's synodic right in there. So patient was developing some, you know, some reflux, some stenosis, and decreased flow. So they went in and did it percutaneously. And um, I think for the sake of time, I won't show that. I'll send them along, but you can come through the angiogram. There's a ton of sequences. But what they did is they, they balloon they ballooned open the um, stenosis with just balloon angioplasty. And then for the leak, they actually put an amplatzer across the leak to close the leak, which was pretty clever. So they were able to successfully close the, um, the repaired um, uh, scimitar baffle. And of course, because it was a scimitar, I just should show the other anomalies. And you'll see the right lung is hypoplastic. Looks like there's just a single segment to the upper lobe, an apical segment. And the middle lobe seems to have only one segment. There's a partial fissure here. And then I see maybe two basal segments from the lower lobe and a tiny superior segment. So it's an abnormal lobation, abnormal airway branching, absent native pulmonary veins, a left SVC, um, and in this case, the scimitar drained the entire lung. Hmm. That was fun. We've seen a lot of scimitars, but this is the first one I've seen repaired and then a complication of the repair. Um, real quickly, and David, I don't know if you shared these cases, but Jitesh had sent me these two wonderful cases of anomalous venous drainage. 
um, and stop me if, if we've already shown these, but this is the first one uh, here. This is, um, you see there's an aberrant right subclavian, and then if we follow the drainage on the left, you'll see there's no communication with the left atrium. There's a, it looks like a nubbin of what would have been a pulmonary vein, but you see this pulmonary vein comes into the mediastinum and actually crosses the midline and goes down and joins up with the uh, portal, what would be the portal vein. The CT doesn't go all the way down, but there's a coronal MRA that shows that anomalous drainage into the portal system, this big guy here. So I don't know if this technically would be a left scimitar. Hmm. Yeah. But, so that was one, and this was another one. This is another case of anomalous venous drainage. So this patient also has a vertical vein running on the left, but instead of going, in, there's been um, an, an Can see it, if. Oh, sorry. There we go. All right, there you go. So vertical vein on the left. It looks like there's been um, a co repair with a stent. But this vein then dives into the mediastinum, crosses in the subcrinal space, and it then receives the left pulmonary vein and one of the right pulmonary veins, the inferior vein. There's a native superior vein on the right, but there are uh, no native veins on the left. So the entire left lung drains into anomalous vessel that then drains into the right atrium, but it does, I mean left atrium, but it does it through the right. And then there's this kind of rudimentary little pulmonary vein. And I take that back, there is a small left inferior vein here. So the left upper lobe drains into the right inferior pulmonary vein through this what looked like was trying to be a left SVC at some point, and it is a vertical vein that communicates also with the left brachycephalic vein. So kind of some crazy. Wow. Yeah. So uh, transmediastinal anomalous venous drainage from one to the other, one lung to the other. Correct. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's got this big, big guy coming in here, and it's associated with the coarc and. Um, I think those are the only anomalies I dug out of this. I didn't see any airway anomalies, but yeah. So I had a co arc too at some point. All right. Well, but those are from Jitesh at UW uh, Washington. So um, I'll send those along too. All right. Well, thank you very much. Guys, before we hang up, can I ask a question? Sure. Tom Winter at Utah, uh, Howard, sent me an email asking whether we are doing any studies on people who've had uh, esophageal endoscopy to check for leaks afterwards. I guess giving oral contrast, some dilute contrast to check for leaks. And I, as far as I know, we're not doing that at UW. Are you guys doing that at all? The Are the GI people asking for leak checks via CT and oral contrast? No, we do them with fluoroscopy. Yeah, we do it, yeah. We have a protocol here mm -hmm. um, for patients, for example, that have had endoscopic procedures with balloon dilatation, for example. Mm -hmm. So we have a CT protocol in which we um, really combine about, I think it's around five cc's of contrast medium with like 97 cc's of water. Mm -hmm. And the patient drinks that 100 cc's of liquid just prior to imaging on the CT scanner, looking for a esophageal perforation. And then there's a similar one for suspected gastric perforation, yeah. Okay. How about you, Brent? Are you doing them by any chance? Brent's gone. Uh, no, we're we're not um, not doing them. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. David. Yeah, some of the protocols.